you don't like something, it's his fault from now on. I have nothing to do with it. Welcome, Randy. Ah, thank you so much. Great to be with everybody this morning. Pastor Eric. Right. <clears throat> this is my first Sunday, so no pressure, right? No pressure. Preaching uh, up in front of the second service. Uh, we're so happy to be here. Uh, so my family, a little bit about us. We were, I was on a, I was a, excuse me. I was a pastor at a church in New York for the last six years. We were attending that church for seven years. And it's just, a, it was a season, kind of came to an end. COVID forced us uh, out of our, the condo that we had been renting and we had to buy a house. And we were in the middle of COVID trying to buy a house. Anybody try to do that? It was obnoxious. It was rough. We we're getting outbid by like 80 grand in cash by people who had 80 grand in cash just laying around on top of their high bids already. And God brought us to this little town and this little this house in uh, Bethlehem, Connecticut, of all places. <clears throat> so we live in the woods. We live in Bethlehem, Connecticut. We've been there uh, since probably like a year and a half ago. Um, my, we have, we can show the picture here. I have two little girls. Um, I'll describe them. <laughs> I really, okay. So one's about this tall. <laughs> she blonde. Uh, hey, there they are. Good, thank you. Oh, right behind me, yes. So this is Maya, my oldest, Maya, and Zara, my youngest. So we got uh, um, seven years old and almost five years old. Uh, they are awesome. If you have had children that age, if you have them now, you know a couple things. You know, joy, you know, they bring all kinds of like happiness, uh, exhaustion, <laughs> tiredness. Uh, no, they're, they're uh, an amazing blessing of God in our lives. I never thought I was going to have kids growing up. I was always like, I'm not going to have any kids. I don't want any kids. And then uh, later on, God changed my heart. And I'm so glad that, that the Lord did that. Um, my wife, as Pastor Eric mentioned, my wife, her name is Andrea. Andrea, if you're fancy, if you can kind of like Andrea. Uh, she is from Bogota, Colombia, which honestly is kind of weird. Uh, because we were not expecting uh, to, to meet uh, Pastor Eric and his wife, who's also from the same city. They know people in like kind of in common, which was a huge surprise to us. Um, one, of the, one of the things at the risk of reopening some people's high school Spanish wounds, one of the things that, that we ended up doing, we've been married for 16 years, all kinds of adventures and, and good times. We were normal, right? Good times, tough times, but good times. And uh, we spent some time on an adventure living in Bogota, Colombia. So we spent like six months down there, uh, her and I, before we had kids, and, and I learned a, a little bit of Spanish, so I can speak a little bit. If you speak Spanish, try me out. You're gonna be uh, disappointed, but we'll, we'll, we'll have some fun. Uh, I learned some things in that time. Again, like I said, at the risk of reopening some uh, people's high school Spanish wounds, I learned that Spanish is the language of many accents and many syllables. For example, in English, you have like library. In Spanish, it's biblioteca. In English, you got pants. In Spanish, you got pantalones, right? And it's, and it's the same with, with all the, the little, uh, you know, the areas and the place names too down there. We'd be in the city of Bogota, and there's all kinds of city buses going by, and on the front of it, it has the destination where they're going, and it would be like 45 syllables long, and I would, I would try to like, you know, pronounce them correctly, and maybe turn to my, my father-in-law or something, and be like, chicken quira? And he's like, no, mijo, chicken quira. Okay. And there's one, fuzigazuga? No, 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 mijo. Fuzugazuga. So I had to learn accents and syllables, and it was a real, real, real uh, amazing time. Been absolutely blessed by that. So I have my my two girls, my amazing wife. They're like the amazing loves of my life, right? Except for Jesus, obviously. They are the loves of my life. I'm so blessed. But it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. Um, can I be myself a little bit? Is that okay? That was my first Sunday, and that's probably like a little bit weird. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so once upon a time, right, your guy here, uh, Randy Ran, was a, I, I was, I had no idea who Jesus was. I didn't grow up in the church. I, I was completely and absolutely just lost, just lost. And one of the things that, that I, I kind of, I, I think is true, it is totally true, is that everything has a beginning. And we'll start here in scripture, right, at the beginning. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And I'm going to try and not mess this up this time. In the beginning, God. Is it there? Hey, good job, Randy. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. It means even before I knew God, even back there when I was doing whatever crazy thing that I was doing, in the beginning, before me was God, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void, 
Try it again. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I want Bible nerds kind of pay attention here. You might already know this. For trivia's sake, if anybody ever asks you, where's the Trinity in the Bible? I can't find it anywhere. It's actually like page one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's God the Father. What's going on? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. We see here, right after this, God says, let there be light. And that's the word, that's the sun. God says, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And there was evening and morning the first day. That's the beginning. In the beginning. And just like everything has a beginning, which is ultimately found here in the first chapter of Genesis, everyone has a beginning. You have a beginning. You come from somewhere, right? You were born somewhere. Where you were born is not the same place that I was born. And your family is not the same as my family. Maybe your language is not the same as the language that I was born into. The culture that you're from is maybe not the same as the culture I was born into. Everyone has a beginning. Everyone has a story. And the amazing thing about God is he has this crazy ability to take people from all over the world, every nation, tribe, and tongue, and break down the barriers, the dividing walls that would keep us divided and unite us in a way in Christ, where we would all be called his children, those of us who believe in Christ, have Christ in our hearts. God has that amazing way of doing those things. In my beginning, I was born to a young woman, she was 17 when she had me, my mother. She was pregnant at 16. My biological, my biological father was 15. I never knew him. My mom did an amazing job for what she was dealt, for what, what she had in her life. She did an amazing job. She did the best that she could. She sacrificed everything to make sure that I could have as normal a childhood as possible. Right? I grew up not too far from here. I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up maybe like a, maybe an hour from here right on the other side of Hartford there. But as I got older and became a teenager, shout outs to any parents of teenagers in here. <laughs> as I got older and became a teenager, I, made, I started making some very uh, questionable decisions, let's call it. Uh, questionable decisions. That doesn't sound familiar to anybody, does it? Questionable decisions and teenagers? Nah. <laughs> um, yeah, so teenage Randy. Yeah, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to show this once, okay? I, I, I want to be clear. I'm going to show this picture once. Once. I might preach a hundred times. This is the only time you get in this picture. Okay, fine. Put it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. Do not gaze upon the glory of the hair. <laughs> Else the curse of baldness may also befall you. <laughs> that was too much back there. I don't know who that was. Stop. <laughs> Yeah, that was me. Uh, anyway, so back then, high school, teenage Randy, you know, full of angst and, and kind of jaded. Um, my, my first job that I ever had was fast food. Anybody else ever have like a, like fast food was your first job? Yeah, you my people. My first job was Subway. I was a sandwich artist. Uh, sandwich Rembrandt, if you want to get technical about it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, Subway was very interesting. I learned a lot about the world and I learned a lot about the way people, people are. I wasn't perfect, but when people would come in and just be like, you know, asking for a sandwich and I'm making a sandwich and they'd just be like, you're stupid, aren't you? Yeah, you're pretty stupid. I'm like, <laughs> I was learning how the world worked, right? Not everybody was like that, but there are some times in life, you know, eye-opening experiences and I, and I do view working in fast food as one of them. And at the time, being kind of a 17-year-old, you know, know-it-all, I had been also reading and putting all kinds of stuff into my mind, right? I was not born in the church. I was not Christian at all. There was no Christians in my family. I started to hang out with kind of the wrong crowd because I was getting jaded and disaffected. And I started to hang out with like the heavy metal kids, right? We wear all black every day. So I started to wear all black every day because I wanted to look tough, even though I was really insecure inside. Sometimes it works like that. And so I was wearing all black every day and I was trying to look tough and I was really trying to act the part. So I started reading things like the Satanic Bible and other stuff. And lo and behold, funny story is the people that wrote that actually believed in that stuff, right? I didn't realize at the time, 
uh, that, that they really believed in what they were saying, but apparently they did because as I started to take all those things into my mind, started reading like Aleister Crowley and other crazy, terrible writings, I started to, it just, it just was like an immense darkness that I was allowing into my life. And it started to, to, to twist things in my mind and actually do something in me. You know, I was, I was jaded, disaffected. I, I thought I was smarter than everybody. It's kind of typical teenager stuff. And I was combining it with all this other stuff that I was reading. I was like a, going to dark death metal shows and, and going into the mosh pits and stuff. I know that sounds ridiculous, right? It totally sounds ridiculous to me to be up here even saying that. But uh, I remember in high school, I had a reputation. So one of my friends bought me this white t-shirt that says, I live for Jesus on it. But it was a joke because I was like openly super anti-Christ. And I would go to these like dark black metal shows and I'd go into the mosh pit and like hit a bunch of people or whatever. And then afterwards I'd take off the shirt at home and I'd look at it and see all these little blood splatters and just like think how cool that I was, right? That's how cool that I was. I thought I was super tough and super cool. Funny, funny, funny what God does. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, jaded, all black, satanic Bible, Mr. Antichrist guy, putting all that stuff into his brain, all that darkness, inviting in all those, sometimes speaking out stuff, because I'd read it in some of these books and be like, asking spirits like into my life and stuff like that, right? That's a terrible idea. I want to I go on record. That is a terrible idea, unless it's the Holy Spirit asking all these things into my life and stuff. And I just kind of lost it. I just kind of went off the deep end and was like, I can't do life anymore. I can't hold a job anymore. I don't want anything to do with anybody. I don't want anything to do with my parents, my, 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 my friends, nothing and nobody. And it's a longer story than this. But at one point in time, I just had enough. And I'm like, I'm leaving. I'm leaving everything. I'm gone. So I need to apologize in advance to the nerds. But I, I took the first ever copy, the first ever episode, the first ever appearance of Iron Man, the comic book, my stepfather had one, and he didn't know what he had. And for those of you who know, it's not Iron Man number one, it's actually Tales of Suspense something. He had that one, and it was in a, a cardboard box like next to the trash because he didn't know what he had. But I knew what he had. <laughs> so in that moment of desperation, I went and I took that Tales of Suspense first ever appearance of Iron Man. It's worth like $30,000 today. I sold it for a hundred bucks to somebody who took advantage of me. And with that hundred bucks, I bought a bus ticket across the country and just took off. Didn't even tell anybody I was leaving, just done. Didn't even take stuff with me, done. Travel across the country with just the clothes on my back. I was so spun out by that darkness that I had invited into my life that I just, I couldn't even see right, for, I couldn't see nothing. I couldn't even barely see that my hand in front of my own face. And I ended up in Phoenix, Arizona, and there was a time, and I'm going to get back to some scripture here, but I want to give you some, some background of me. There was a time in my life walking the streets of Phoenix, being from Connecticut of all places, walking the streets of a city I'd never been to in my life, Phoenix, Arizona, and walking, spending days on the streets, walking down the street one day and seeing a dime, 10 cents on the ground, and thinking in my mind, that's more money on the ground than I have in my entire life right now. More money than I have in my name. And I picked it up and 10 cents was all that I had besides the clothes that was on my back. I remember like my second night on the streets, I met some other people. I was like 20 years old. I met some other, you know, I call them kids, young adults out there as well. West Coast, like that kind of homelessness is like kind of popular, more popular at least. And they, they, they kind of told me the ropes. They told me like where we could sleep at night and stuff. So like my second night on the streets, we slept where they slept. I slept where they slept. They slept behind a dumpster in between a dumpster and like this drop-in center that would give you like, you know, breakfast in the morning and sometimes like fresh socks or allow you to take a shower or something. We slept outside of that thing behind a dumpster. And there was like five, six, seven of us. And they showed me what to do. And I took one piece, one sheet of newspaper and I put it on the ground, the, the pavement behind the dumpster. And I laid down on that just like everybody else was doing. And I took off my shoe and I used it as a pillow because that's what they were doing. And my, my second night in the street was with a newspaper mattress and a shoe for my pillow. 10 cents to my name, left everything behind. And I've been going through much more than this that I don't have time to get into. I was just broken and in darkness and lost and confused. I had allowed so much into my life, 
so much negativity and even evil into my life, demonic stuff into my life. And I remember laying down on that newspaper mattress with that shoe for my pillow and looking up and looking at the open sky because I was living outside at this point. And I saw clouds moving and I could see some stars and the moon and those clouds were moving a little bit and it started to drizzle on me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I might have to like jump into that dumpster and put the top over me to to keep from getting soaked through. And I called out. I called out in the moment, never grew up in church. I called out in that moment. I called out to any God I thought that could save me. I called out to the moon God. I called out to the, to the stars. I called out to the, to, the, to the rain God to make it stop raining. I called out to the wolf God because I thought that was my spiritual animal. And then I called out, and I don't even know why I did. I just called out to the God beyond all those gods, the real God, like the creator God. I didn't even know the name. I didn't even know what I was doing. But I called out in that moment to the God that I do not know, the one who really is. And it's in prayers like that sometimes, these weak little prayers where sometimes we don't even know what we're saying. But God honors a prayer prayed in sincerity, even if it's a weak prayer. And from that moment, God got a hold of my life, my life, and flipped me upside down and changed me. And it's been a long process, and I'm so glad that that was many years ago. But God has been amazing in my life. That's the darkness where I come from. The good news is that everybody has a beginning, right? But in Christ, everybody has two beginnings. Everybody has two beginnings, Nicodemus learned about this. It says, now there was a Pharisee. This is John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night in the dark. He didn't want to be seen. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if it were not with him. If God were not with him. Jesus replied, verily I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus has questions. This is a valid question. How can somebody be born when they are old, Nicodemus asks. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born, right? I feel you, Nicodemus. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. You see, flesh gives birth to flesh. Your parents give birth to you. Flesh gave birth to flesh. But it's not the same way with the spirit. Spirit gives birth to spirit. Spirit gives birth to spirit. And Jesus describes it in an interesting way here. He says, you shouldn't be surprised at my saying you must be born again. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. You can't tell where it comes from, where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You see, that the spirit is like the wind. We live in the woods, right? We live in Bethlehem and we have a bunch of trees outside. And sometimes if the wind is blowing, we might see one tree over here moving. It might be moving pretty good. And the tree next to it is just still. The wind moves wherever it wants. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit, right? In a place like this, a message which is not a message from a man, but maybe it's just from scripture, the power of scripture itself, the Holy Spirit through that word can be just dialing in on somebody like the wind blowing, blowing in somebody's life. And they're kind of blown back because God is doing something and the person next to them is like, hmm, hmm. Somebody behind a dumpster sleeping outside can have the spirit of God starting to do something in his life and the person over there next to him, nothing. Because the spirit moves like the wind. The spirit moves like the wind. And even more, even more, I don't know, I, I didn't do anything. I, I didn't put it in myself to, to, to ask God into my life. I didn't do that. It's like God just plucked me from the fire. 
You ever, you ever look at a campfire and see like a stick and it's right next to the fire and it's in that moment where that stick is starting to like smoke and smolder real good and in like two seconds it's gonna be up in flames. And in that moment, God was like, and just pulled me right out of the fire. I felt like a, a smoldering twig pulled from the fire. Maybe some of you felt like that in your lives. Now, Nicodemus didn't understand this whole thing about being born of the Spirit, but John, the writer of the gospel, did. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning, that should look familiar, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The only two books in the Bible that start with in the beginning, Genesis and John, who was doing it intentionally because he understands. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That same Word that said, let there be light in Genesis. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Amen. The Bible is all about the metaphor of Christ's shining so bright that his brightness is like the sun. His brightness is as bright as brighter than the sun. And have you ever, as a child or as an adult, I hope not, but as a child, made the mistake of looking directly at the sun to see what would happen? You burn your eyes out. It's that bright. It's that bright. And the comparison is constantly about Jesus being as bright, brighter than the sun. If you can barely, if we can barely behold the sun directly in the sun's glory, can you imagine beholding the Son of God in his glory? That's why the Bible talks about people just falling, just falling out, maybe dying, because they can't come face to face with that amount of glory. That's amazing. Christ like the sun. Matthew 4 says it like this. When Jesus shows up on the scene, Matthew 4, 16 says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned, like the morning, like dawned. And people came to know Jesus. That new life, that new day dawned in their hearts. You see, I was in the darkness, the valley of the shadow of death. And boy, God spoke the word over me. Let there be light. And that new day dawned in my heart. And it was a new life for me, a new beginning for me. And God has done so much in my life. And the reason that I'm willing to come up here and semi-embarrass myself and show weird pictures of me with hair and talk about being on the street in 10 cents to my name is to show that if God could do that in somebody like my life. I used to struggle with this story. I used to be ashamed of speaking stuff like this in church because it's like people would look down at me. I don't care anymore. Because in my weakness, let God's strength be shown strong. Right? And what I've, a little secret that I've come to know over years of being in the church, when I start talking about this stuff, like half the people in here are like, yep, I was doing something similar. That's like the dirty secret of church. But it's the amazing thing about church is that God has a resurrection power to resurrect us from the death that we were dead to in our sins. God raises us anew and makes us new people in the same way that someday when my body is broken and in the grave, when I'm asleep in death, God is going to raise me anew from the dead. And the same for you as believers, if you truly believe in Jesus. I would be so bold as to say even the very sun itself rising after the nighttime is going to be a symbol and a shadow and a prophecy, if you will, of the coming of Christ when he rises, shows up in his glory brighter than the sun and everyone rises out of their graves where they were asleep in the darkness of death. That is how mighty and powerful God has created this creation and in this age and in this time of massive wickedness and corruption, it seems, on all sides, right? Like, turn on the news, man. Does anybody feel that? 
Does anybody look at the world and be like, man, we are, I don't, I don't care what side of the political spectrum anybody's on, we can probably all agree, this is kind of a mess, right? And in this time and in this place, if that spirit of God is still living and moving, if that spirit of God is still hovering over the waters of the darkness, moving, about to do something, Maybe it's in your life. Maybe you've never fully come to accept Jesus like Pastor Eric was talking about. Maybe you're in that darkness now, but God is moving and you feel it. Maybe it's time. It certainly is time that you take that step and say, Jesus, I don't know what you're doing. Let there be light in my life. In this age, in this time of this wickedness and corruption, the prayer is that the light of Christ would dawn like the sun of a new day and be seen from east to west. And that maybe, just maybe, if these like whispers of revival and people catching on fire for Jesus and all this stuff, maybe, just maybe, let me just tell you straight, just maybe this could be the beginning of something much bigger than we understand. It could be. Let's not shrink back in fear of that. Let's say, Lord, dawn and have your way. Your light, God, your light be known from east to west that people would know you and repent of their former lives. Acts 19 says this. 19, 18, uh, verse 18 and 19. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. This is a sign of a move of God. And I don't mean to be offensive. Hopefully this isn't offensive, but when God moves and the Spirit moves, it's not just for Christians to come together and have like the Holy Spirit dance party. That can be part of it. But when God's Spirit moves, people are convicted and they say, Lord, because the light has come and it shined into the darkness. And people when they receive the Lord, they react like this. They come, those who now believe, they come and openly confess what they had done. They repent. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. Their old lives, they just threw it at the altar of God, burned it. The amazing thing is that everything has a beginning. In Christ, we all have two beginnings. But today and every day can be a new beginning. Every day can be a new beginning. You can start fresh now. That means today, if you were driving in to church and you're fighting with your wife or your husband or somebody, that means last night if you're partying a little bit too hard, if you struggle with something, if you're bound up in sin and you feel like you can't kick it, you can't move on, you can't succeed with this thing that's on your back, today can be a fresh start and a new beginning for you because if God can take some crazy kid with a newspaper mattress and a shoe for a pillow, if God can take that kid that was like antichrist and wanted nothing to do with Jesus, then what is stopping God from doing that in your life? I'm going to end with this, Lamentations 3. Because of the Lord's great love, oh, I should probably click this. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. Their mercies, excuse me, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. Father, we just thank you. Thank you for your grace and your peace and your mercy, God. Lord, that if that spirit is hovering over people's lives right now, if it's moving of God, if you're up to something in someone's life in this room or on the internet, let there be light, God, that they would come to know your goodness, Lord, that they would taste and see that the Lord is good, God, and that you would bring them along in that mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Pastor Eric, let's give it up for the Lord this morning, yeah? Thank you, Lord. So good to have uh, Pastor Randy, Randy here today, and Andrea and their beautiful family. And 
it's exciting to see what God can do to our life that's completely surrendered to him. And I think there's hope for all of us because God's not interested in church people that think they have that their act together. He cares about people that are willing to become real and let his light touch them. And so maybe some of you have faced that today. Maybe some of you uh, need to throw your things in the fire. Maybe you're involved with things you shouldn't be involved with. Can we just take a moment to pray one more time? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, I pray there's anyone here, I know we prayed this already, but there's anyone here that is living with a lie, living with something that's haunting them. Father, we want to throw it into the fire and become free. And so, Lord, I pray for those that are struggling with addictions, drug addictions, porn addictions, infidelity, unforgiveness, or just flat out apathy. Lord, we're asking in Jesus' name, we just want to take that off right now. We want to throw it into you, God, for you are more than enough. You're more than enough, Lord. If you could take a 20-year-old on the street, you can take anyone. We thank you for this story today. That's a true story of your redemption and your new beginnings. And so, Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, we want to surrender these areas of our lives right now. We're tired of living a lie. Lord, I pray that the religious spirit of we think that we're better than anyone else would die here today in Jesus' name. It is by grace we are saved, not from ourselves, lest anyone can boast. And so, Lord God, as the Apostle Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. Lord, it's by your grace. We just pray right now in Jesus' name for new beginnings. Amen. 